Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Peter Llewellyn, and for those of you who don't know me, I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, um, where you'll find resources, activities going on for people working in and around, or wanting to work in and around medcoms across the globe, by which I'm talking medical communications, medical education, medical publishing. So please do go and have a look at that. Uh, what we're doing at the moment is running some of these Zoom meetings, which are great in terms of uh, inviting and engaging with more people from more parts of the world. Uh, today I'm very happy to have Laurie Arnstein join us from Envision. Uh, Laurie is going to talk us through uh, patient involvement in scientific communications. Um, so we're going to have a presentation, we'll follow that with a Q&A. Um, so um, thank you. Uh, on that note, I'm going to hand over to Laurie to start her presentation. Cheers. Thanks Peter and thanks for the invite. Uh, great to be here, great to see so many of you on the line as well. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen, so bear with me one second, I'm not very used to Zoom. And then we will start. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, and so this is going to be about 15-20 minute presentation, so we're going to have some time for questions afterwards. And I'm going to be covering patient involvement in scientific communications. So firstly, um, obviously, you can see my face on the screen here as well. There's a little picture of me there. You can check that they match. Um, quick introduction to me. So, my name's Laurie Arnstein. I'm patient partnership liaison at Envision Pharma Group. And um, in terms of my background and how I kind of reached this kind of position, um, I actually trained as a medical doctor, um, did my foundation training, and realized it wasn't right for me. So, I became a medical writer, um, mostly working in medical affairs, mostly oncology. I uh, did that for about three and a half years and during that time I was becoming more and more interested in the patient piece. This is something which I think has been gathering momentum over the last few years um, and then I was able to make that into a dedicated role about a year and a half ago and um, so that's why I'm here today talking to you. So it's only a short presentation but I've pulled together a few objectives just for us to cover. Um, I'm just wondering here, can you, is this covering the slides, these little uh, thumbnail videos there we go hopefully that's better no you're fine Laurie you're fine great so firstly we want to understand actually why we should be involving patients in scientific communications also understanding where we can involve patients in publications specifically as a kind of an element of scientific communications and then we're going to actually look at how we can do this so looking at best practices and a couple of real world examples in two key areas, plain language summaries of publications and also patient authorship or contribution of, um, for publications. So I think a really important question to start out with is why would we do this? Obviously, patient involvement adds an extra layer of complexity, sometimes of, of cost and other challenges. So it's important just to examine the question of why. So we know that there are places for patients to be involved across the entire R&D life cycle. So this is um, a figure that you might have seen before. It's from a paper from UPATI. So that's a European um, umbrella patients group. And they've really laid out all of the stages where they see patient involvement as being really crucial. So that's through from setting research priorities right at the very start of the cycle, through design and planning of research, actually conducting the clinical trials, and then finally actually disseminating the research results. And this is the part that we are interested in as MedCommerce professionals. So you can see post-study communication highlighted here as a really important element. And we know that a lot of this drive is actually coming from patients. Not all patients, but many patients want to understand published research, but at the moment it's not that easy. So you can see on the left-hand side here, we've got some data from a survey of people with a rare condition and their carers. And you can say the majority of them are interested in scientific publications related to their condition, but very few of them can understand them. And actually, they're not getting much help from Dr. Google either, so few consider the internet to be a useful source for better understanding. Um, and really, the true meaning of a publication is to make content available to the public. And at the moment, this isn't really happening. So we've got another example here you can see on the right-hand side um, of a patient posting on a multiple sclerosis forum. And she's asking, which publications published the latest medical research and trials? Is The Lancet a good publication? I'm sure none of you are kind of sitting there wondering whether The Lancet is a good publication or not, but how would you know that if you weren't able to access it? 
So she's saying that she's just had a look, it won't let me fully read the articles. So here you can see an example where even accessing the articles is impossible, but actually once someone actually gets in and accesses them, are they able to understand the content? Is it user friendly? And some patients actually aren't waiting for the published data. They're going one step earlier than that. They're attending congresses as delegates and they're actually producing their own content based on that. So you can see an example here of um, a patient with narcolepsy. So she's actually attending a congress and producing her own congress report. And you can see here, she's actually saying, please remember, I failed high school biology. So if you can imagine someone who, you know, maybe has quite a limited level of scientific training attending a congress and thinking about what they're likely to take away from it. And we can see there the need for accessible scientific content is really, is really big. So where can we start? I've laid out here some of the steps that you can take to involving patients in the publication's life cycle through from uh, publication planning into use and assessment. So you could involve a patient in planning by involving them on your publication steering committee. Patients can be contributors or authors to peer reviewed publications. Plain language summaries can be a really um, kind of useful tool in terms of sharing the results of publications. And again, patients can be involved um, as sort of key players in the use and assessment of publications. So we first started looking at this question about two years ago, and um, we actually held our own forum around ISMAP in January 2018, around actually, you know, what are the current opportunities for involving patients in publications based on this life cycle. And actually the overwhelming conclusion from that day was that plain language summaries are the biggest current opportunity. Um, and we saw that back sort of beginning of 2018, obviously now coming towards the end of 2019, and we're seeing that continue to grow. So I thought it would be a really nice opportunity just to share a bit with you in terms of what we've been seeing um, and how we've been approaching this question. So we see plain language summaries as falling into three main categories, two of which relate to peer reviewed publications. So you can see in the blue on the left hand side there, um, we've got the pl um, plain language summaries of clinical trial results based on CSRs. Um, and the terminology that um, tend to be used for these is lay summaries. In the EU, these are mandated um, by the EMA. Um, and so it's, that's for all clinical trials which are conducted in the EU. They'll need to have a, um, a lay summary written um, within a year of the trial closing. And the EMA are building a database to house these at the moment. Um, that was meant to go live last year. It's been a bit delayed. Um, and I think with things like Brexit, it's meant that it's been delayed even more. So we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Um, it's slated for 2020 at the moment. Um, across in the US, the FDA thinks they're important too, um, but does not currently mandate them. And so we tend to separate those out into a separate category of, um, of plain language summaries. And actually more what we're going to talk about today are the um, categories on the right hand side in the purple. So the plain language summaries of peer reviewed publications. And so those could include um, manuscript publications or um, plain language summaries of Congress materials. So that could be abstracts. Um, for posters or even oral presentations. These aren't currently mandated, but we're seeing them increasingly being explored by journals and by industry. Um, and they are really important, I think, to distinguish from the lay summaries because they can cover a much broader range of evidence types. So, for example, um, you can do plain language summaries of publications for any kind of publication. So that can be clinical trial data, um, clinical trial data anywhere globally, so not just in the EU. Um, HUR studies, systematic reviews, just really kind of any kind of evidence that you think might be of interest to a wider audience. So in this context, plain language summaries can help to address patients' needs for accessible scientific content. So I've got some data here from a systematic review that was presented earlier this year. Um, and one of the main conclusions was that plain language summaries can encourage patients to engage with research and actually gain up-to-date knowledge and some survey data supporting this. So a US-based survey of patients and caregivers showed that plain language summaries could help them to interpret key research findings and actually understand what's relevant to them from a piece of research. 
There's also evidence that plain language summaries can help to empower patients um, and their carers in having discussions with healthcare professionals. So again, having access to plain language summaries can help people to feel empowered. And actually um, there's evidence that they can help um, people to discuss treatment options with their treating physicians. Um, and so in this context, plain language summaries can really help to generate dialogue and also make that communication easier um, in terms of um, someone feeling empowered and more knowledgeable to be able to, um, to kind of share their opinions and thoughts. We know that increasing numbers of journals are publishing plain language summaries. So um, this study is from 2017. Um, so it's slightly out of date and I'm pretty sure the numbers would be higher now, just anecdotally from having um, talked with publishers. Um, but back then, where we saw that PLS publishing wasn't happening very frequently, but it was increasing. So this was a review of nearly 8,000 journals and less than 1% of them were publishing plain language summaries alongside the main abstract. It tended to be newer journals who were doing this. Um, and it also tended to be plain language summaries published alongside the main abstract as a kind of a short piece of text. And actually something which we found can be quite an interesting approach is submitting a plain language summary as a supplement instead. And that can give you a lot more flexibility in terms of including graphics, um, including more information and um, having more um, creativity in terms of the layout. So we know that not that many journals are currently publishing plain language summaries. But we know that among the journals that are publishing them, there's a lot of variation. So um, here's a study from um, ISMAP earlier this year, so which looked at 10 journals who are currently publishing plain language summaries. And they found that among these 10 journals, they were actually using nine different terms for plain language summaries. There was a lot of variability in terms of who was writing them. So whether it was the original author of the manuscript, editors of the journal, maybe a professional medical writer, went they're required, so which stage of the manuscript submission process, which articles they were required for, so all articles, um, only you know when they're being submitted by the authors or only when the um, editors are requesting them. The majority are freely accessible, although there was um, one journal which didn't make them freely accessible. And there was a lot of um, variability in terms of whether the plain language summaries could be found on PubMed. So we um, kind of took this evidence um, and decided that we really needed to think about providing some kind of guidance which could really help to start addressing this um, and so we actually held a workshop in November last year um, where we brought uh, patients, publishers and um, some industry colleagues together to co-create a toolkit and so we made this toolkit available earlier this year at ISMAP um, and this is a resource which is really um, meant to be something which is for people to take away and adapt to their own needs. So it's freely available, it's under a CCBY 4.0 license, and it's something which um, we just want it to be a starting point for people. It's not meant to be um, kind of the only resource out there, it's just really giving people a starting point that they can then build on. And we're actually working with um, the Global Umbrella Group Patient Focused Medicines Development to further develop this into their um, PLS how-to guide. So that's something that's ongoing at the moment. Um, and we did also win the Best Practice Award is map for it, which was really great. Um, just kind of, you know, showing that I think practical tools are something that the industry really needs in terms of moving PLS forward in a compliant and um, effective way. So I wanted to just show a real world example of how these can look. And so this is a case study again, which um, was published at ISMAP. And this was uh, plain language summaries of Congress abstracts or APLS for short. And um, we did an initial pilot of this at ASCO 2018. So we took 12 of the submitted abstracts and we developed plain language summaries for them. Um, and the way that these were accessed were via a QR code on the scientific poster. So I'm sure many of you in the audience will have been to ASCO. Um, I've been a couple of years um, in a row and the poster hall is massive. There's thousands of posters. They change every couple of hours. And so we were really wondering how many people would find these. And um, once you'd scan the QR code, you could then download the plain language summary, print it or, or redirect it back to the original scientific abstract. So we're able to sort of track those metrics. Um, and as I mentioned, we felt like it might be a bit like finding a needle in the haystack, but actually every APLS was accessed. Um, and we found that um, 
as you'd expect, the access peaks corresponded with when the research was being presented. So people were really standing in front of the posters, scanning the QR codes and accessing the plain language summaries. And we weren't able to do any quantitative user testing, but we were able to get some qualitative feedback um, from attendees. And they found actually there was a really high level of interest from specifically the non-MD attendees. And so we were kind of quite encouraged by this. We went on to expand the pilot um, to additional congresses through 2018. So you can see data here from those four additional congresses. And we found that, again, the majority were viewed. Most of them had further actions taken. And another really interesting point was that for a couple of the congresses, we were able to do an information sheet which had all the QR codes just laid out. And so people could access them whenever they wanted during the congress. So um, this is an initiative that is still ongoing, but I think it's a really interesting example of how the, the plain language summaries can be put into practice and kind of developed over time. So I think a lot of the time it's about just taking the first step, setting up a process and then taking it from there rather than you know, thinking that you need to know everything at the beginning. It's a really steep learning curve, but it, and it's really great that we're starting to see plain language summaries being done more and more. So just moving on to talk briefly about um, patient authorship, because I think this is also something which we're seeing more and more of, and it's really important to get a bit of an overview of. So we know that patient authorship is already here. Patients are already authoring peer review publications across a range of different journals. Um, they're meeting um, authorship criteria fully and actually being, um, being named as authors. So you can see here just some screenshots of different publications that have a patient co-author. And sometimes these can be very patient-focused journals, but they're also being seen across all other fields as well. But at the moment, patient um, authorship isn't very common. And so we really want to um, find a pathway from a place where there's limited patient authorship. So it's kind of somewhere along the middle of this arrow towards ethical and effective patient authorship. And obviously there's different approaches you can take with this. So you can have the trial and error approach. <clears throat> so that would mean just kind of trying to find a way. Um, sometimes things can go a bit wrong. Sometimes you sort of stumble, <clears throat> excuse me, stumble on the right thing and eventually get, get to the end point. But what we wanted to do was really look um, at developing some evidence-based recommendations to really kind of help the industry move from A to B a bit more smoothly. And part of that was a systematic review, um, which we started um, was a little while back now, it's actually in submission at the moment, where we wanted to come up with some um, evidence-based recommendations um, to guide people to um, involve patients as co-authors both before, during, and after manuscript preparation. So again, this was something we actually published at ISMAP earlier this year, for anyone um, who might have um, been there, so I'm not gonna kind of go through all the details, um, but we did have um, several patients co-authoring this manuscript with us, um, and that was actually a really great learning experience, um, I think for me and for the rest of the, the authorship team, because we were developing recommendations, but at the same time, kind of learning how to do patient authorship ourselves. So it's actually a really great experience. Um, and the main thing we were looking at was the benefits and harms of involving patients um, as co-authors or in um, res uh, results reporting more generally. Um, and so, as I mentioned, this manuscript's in submission, so I'm not gonna kind of show the, um, the data in, in detail. You can keep an eye out for it. And um, when it's published, hopefully it will be sharing it more widely. But um, we found overall that all the, the benefits really did outweigh the harms of patient authorship. Um, I think it's really important to note that there still can be some harms. So in terms of things like um, ensuring that the balance of power is right between academic co-authors and patient co-authors, um, ensuring that people have adequate tra training. But in general, the balance was really in favour of the positive. So, you know, people developing new skills, learning new ways to work with each other, gaining really unique and valuable insights. Um, so that was kind of really, really great to see. And in terms of the recommendations, so there's 21 of them, so I'm not going to go through all of them um, with you now, but I thought it might be quite interesting just to know which of the recommendations our patient authors thought were most important out of the 21. So before manuscript preparation, 
they thought it was most important to involve patients in the question formulation stage. So actually um, making sure that publications undress key unmet needs that are important and relevant to patients. During manuscript preparation, they thought it was most important to recognise and respect diversity in the authorship team. So that means that patients can bring really valuable um, insights through their lived experience. They don't necessarily need to be medical writers or statisticians. They bring something equal and equally valuable to the table. And then after manuscript preparation, they thought the most important recommendation was to involve patients in the dissemination plan um, and just making sure that it goes through the correct channels and reaches the right audiences. So I think. Um, that was really, it's really kind of useful just to, to actually find out what's most relevant to them, even within the context of a project about patient authorship. So I know that we're coming up to time. And so I've just pulled out a few key takeaways from today. Um, obviously, you've got some time for questions. So patient involvement in scientific communications is happening. It's not a question of whether it's going to happen. It's a question of how it's going to happen and how we're going to do it right. In this context, plain language summaries are a quote unquote easy first step to involving patients in publications. So it's a good entry point, not necessarily easy, but I think it's a good place to start. And we know the interest from key stakeholders is growing. We know that patients are already, already authoring peer reviewed publications, and actually, we need um, evidence based guidelines to help us minimize risks and maximize benefits. And as you, as medical communications professionals, start to enter this new space, there's practical tools and guidance which are available to support you, a couple of which I shared today. Obviously, there's more out there and hopefully that body of evidence will continue to grow. So thanks very much. Um, I think we're going to run through some questions now um, and you can always connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, just search for my name um, if you've got anything else you'd like to follow up with. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Laurie. Can we get rid of the slides and um, yes, just go back to us? So thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Very clear. I like the slides. Um, so to those of you listening to us online at the moment, just a reminder, at the bottom of your screen, you've got a Q&A button and a chat button. Um, either of those will pull up a text box and you can send in your observations, your comments and your questions. Um, either of those two ways and we'll pick it up from here. So I'm very keen that this, uh, this Q&A session is led by you guys out there. So please do ping us some questions and there's a couple starting to come in. Um, Laurie, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take my little sort of um, executive position here, you know, in hand and, and just make a couple of comments or, or observations. I mean, and, and, and I think it's, I'm not trying to boast here, but you know, in, prepara in preparing for today's uh, webinar, which I, I do a little bit of, um, I, I just had a bit of a poke around and um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about PLS um, generally and in medcoms. And, um, you know, I, I went to look at some of the publishers, a couple of publishers I know uh, talked to recently said, oh, we, we do publish PLS. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just had a bit of a poke around there and elsewhere um, and really didn't find very much at all. I mean, you know, I, I know there's, there's talk about it and it's taking off. You've mentioned that a couple of years ago, it was a very low number. You said the numbers are increasing. Although, what are the numbers, I suppose, is my question. But just, I'm mean, literally, the best part of 30 minutes, I spent spoke, poking around uh, and found almost nothing, except I think it was the Research, uh, research Involvement and Engagement Journal, um, yeah. where, where immediately I was finding plain English um, summaries. Um, so just, just again, I'm just, just being very open here. I mean, you know, this is something that is really a very early stage, isn't it? And, and you're up against publishers and, and, and you may have very strong recommendations. You may have had your workshops to discuss this on, but are the publishers buying into this and how are they, they doing so? Um, and why is it so difficult to find any examples of these things? Can you just sort of comment generally sure. on that? Yeah, so those are all great questions. Um, I would definitely agree that it's quite early stages. I would say what we're seeing at the moment is, from our side anyway, a bit of a tipping point being reached in terms of the interest in PLS. And it's gonna take a bit of time until that follows through to actually seeing them out there. And um, the question of where to find them, that's a thing that we've been discussing for ages because there's no one central place that they're gonna be housed. Obviously, ideally, that's something that we'd like to see, but there's no equivalent to the, you know, the potential EMA database being built. And the fact that these are really difficult to make visible in PubMed is a big issue, I think, currently at the moment. So we've kind of anecdotally had some chats with a publisher who's been working with PubMed on this. And there's a lot of challenges in terms of the way it's programmed, which make it difficult to kind of add in a PLS. Um, I 
completely have had the same experience when we first look, started looking at these just googling for them doesn't really turn up much so i think it's a big ongoing question is how to make these more visible um, and where you can actually post them because obviously the journal sharing them and posting them kind of alongside the main article in a way that's easy to find i think is a good starting point there but then there's questions about whether you know patient groups might share them whether it would be suitable for a pharma company to share them you know there's lots of different questions around that but i think ideally we'd want some kind of neutral repository where we can see these but i think we're a way off from that now all oh, right okay so i suppose i've always thought about it as you know an article being published in a journal and a pls being presented alongside of it which mm -hmm. to my mind of thinking made i just assumed that the journal and the publisher was responsible for putting that alongside and therefore you've got lots of journals out there and the problem of dealing with lots of journals and are they going to are they going to make that possible but are you seriously thinking there's going to be some sort of central database of pls and if so who's going to develop that so um we've had that. some ongoing discussions with pfmd and um, so i know that that's something they were interested in doing the um patient focused medicines is your partners your young yeah. yeah but then they do tons of other stuff so i think it's not necessarily you know the, the number one priority for patient involvement but i think in terms obviously the drive coming from the journals is a really good thing and i think um, a lot of journals do have a kind of a champ you need a champion really for the plain language summaries because obviously there's something that it's additional to set up there's additional complexity associated with it and we've met quite a few publishers who are real champions for them and are kind of working in the same way that maybe people within trial sponsors or people within medcoms are working you need know, to kind of to work it out so i think it's we're sort of seeing that level of interest growing but again it's very variable just depending on what people's own interests are what their priorities are okay 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 um, and again just um, it's a, a personal area of confusion or, or whatever for me um pls when i've talked to publishers they they seem to tend to talk about pls as being something that increases the access you know making it more accessible to other specialists and interested and informed people patients maybe but it's sort of down the list as it were whereas you're very much coming up with this from the point of view where it seems to me that pls is for patients is it is it is it as simple as that or can you put a bit of nuance on that yeah it's definitely more nuanced so we see patients as being a really important audience but not the only audience so it's basically anyone who's a non-technical expert so anyone who isn't within that specific field and doesn't have scientific training so obviously you've got the question of finding kind of a general reading level or a general idea of an audience in your head when you're writing one and that can vary depending on you know who the target audience is but we would be going with a kind of a level where it might not be suitable for like every single member of the public because you can't do something for absolutely mm -hmm. everyone that would also then be suitable for a non-specialist HCP mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. but it's really just looking at thinking about the kinds of people who would be interested in these and just trying to make it as broadly accessible as possible and i think it's it's not about kind of excluding any audience in particular it's just about making it as broad as possible and also keeping patients in mind as an audience rather okay. than just saying it's for you know for scientists for one or other yeah okay 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 yeah. and again and that just gets mixed up in the terminology and the discussions about this i mean people talk about yeah. patient summaries and you know and, exactly. and this sort of thing which 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 confuses i think yeah. so that's why we um, call them plain language summaries actually that's why we settled with that just because it, it does kind of enable that broader term and we also see them as being useful just in general for the public or for media to you know reduce the risk of misinterpretation as well so there's really lots of different potential angles yeah, yeah yeah i mean I, I read a, i had a press release a few days ago and i was reading it it was all about how PL, publication of pls is increasing and it wasn't until really quite well into the press release i realized they weren't talking about pls as you're talking about it in terms they were talking very much about lay summaries um uh, on the uh, and clinical trial transparency reports reporting yeah. and so, on. Yeah. so you so know very a, different topic really yeah that's a big um that's why we kind of have the slide with the three buckets yeah. on it just yeah. to sort of keep yeah. it clear in our own heads but also when we're talking to people that that they are you know there's a lot of overlap in terms of how you might approach them but they are different pieces with different different audiences okay okay um uh, so let's just pick up some of these questions we've got a number of questions coming in let's see if we can we can pick up on some of this and let's sort of start at the top um Jason, let's, so let's start with PLS. One thing I should say, I think scientific communications is a very broad area. We've, we've focused in on 
uh, PLS type um, activity and patient authorship. And I think in terms of this Q&A, we should probably try and stick to those areas if we can before we go off in too many different directions. Um, Jason, let's just go back right to you. Jason saying, you mentioned compliant. What does a compliant PLS mean to you? To be honest, I wasn't sure what stage you mentioned that. Do you remember? What's a compliant PLS? So I think I mentioned that when I was talking about needing some guidance for it. Um, and I think for me, compliant would mean making sure that it's not promotional in any way. So that is something which comes in, I think, really strongly with the language, um, because I think there's a big um, kind of area of caution with plain language summaries in terms of if they are for patients, not having any perception of direct to consumer promotion. Right, right. And that's not the intention behind them at all. And it shouldn't be for anyone writing them. But it's something where you have to, we have to be quite careful just to make sure we don't have that perception. So it's really just making sure that the plain language summary is completely accurate. It accurately reflects the original content, um, sort of the way that the information is being presented. There's, it's not making any claims. And you can do this, you know, obviously while still making it accessible and interesting for people. It's just kind of making sure that... Um, yeah, it's still kind of a neutral. Piece. Okay, but when we're talking about compliant, we're not compliant. We're not compliant with a particular um, regulation or, or, or code of practice or something, are we? And 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 you're talking about the sort of the promotional stuff. There's a couple of questions coming in about the dangers of disguised promotion and so on. You know, what what are the rules? What are the regulate? Or what are the potential regulations and transparency type issues around this? Who 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 dictates whether something is or isn't crossing that line or not? Um, so there's a couple of bits of guidance um, kind of in other forms of guidance. So there's um, a point in the IFPMA guidance, which basically states that um, communicating with the public isn't the same as promoting to them. So that really makes the point that actually you still can right. do communication without it being promotional. But we've taken quite a lot of our approach from um, the EU regulations. So they have a kind of a supporting guidance document and also the MRCT toolkit which covers how to write the clinical trial results lay summaries. That's the lay summaries, yeah. And they talk quite a lot about using neutral language and how to make sure that you're not writing a promotional lay summary. And so that advice has been really useful, I think, in terms of informing our approach as well. But again, like we said, there's no current guideline, guidelines. Um, the toolkit that we created wasn't meant to be a kind of a legal compliance document. And that's something which right. people internally, so within sponsors, will need to sort of have those discussions with their compliance teams. Okay, I understood. Yeah. And do you find working with a number of different pharma companies, I mean, presumably you find the interpretation of all this varies quite a lot. So um, you know, can you say a few words about how you find the pharma companies in terms of their willingness to support or not PLS or, 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 or how rigorous are they in, in worrying about, you know, whether they comply with whatever? Yeah, I think um, people are very sort of at different stages in terms of their comfort level or maybe how much they've thought about PLS or looked into them. Um, I would say we're, we see the level of interest increasing, but um, in terms of the actual sort of compliance discussions, I think it, people's comfort level is very different and it really just yeah. kind of depends on having those discussions early and just getting the process in place rather than kind of retrospectively going back and saying like, oh, we wanted to do this you know, for a specific Congress and then it's really t timelines. It's really just kind of having early discussions. Okay. Okay. I mean, again, I, I, I often end up saying this or find myself saying this in these sorts of discussions. It's like, you know, some of this sounds very straightforward and, and presumably everyone goes, yeah, 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 yeah. But real life gets in the way and people and, and, and committees of people trying to make decisions about what should be done. Um, and I would have thought, again, I, I guess we're just saying the same thing. This is at an early stage, so people are having to sort of um, adapt to, to or to work out how they, um, they, they deal with this. Um, Jason, again, when in, in the process of developing a manuscript, when, when in the process of developing a manuscript, is it most effective, efficient to develop an associated PLS? Um, so we have so far done this from a couple of different standpoints. So we've developed PLS alongside the development of the main manuscript and then submitted both at the same time. And we've also done um, a retrospect, we've done retrospective plain language summaries where you go back to a publication that maybe had a very high level of interest among patients and you might have had a request actually that you wanted a PLS version of it. So we've done it from both perspectives. Um, I would say it's more, it's easier to do it alongside the main manuscript because obviously retrospectively you have to kind of go back and. Um, kind of have those discussions about adding something on um, and so I think it's probably more effective to do it alongside if you can and that also suggests that you've been thinking about patient involvement from earlier in the process which is ideally what we'd want to do 
and developing a PLS alongside it rather than thinking, oh, that would, be, would have been great if we'd have involved patients and going back, but both are possible. Again, just to state the obvious, but I guess it's an obvious point that um, if in the process of submitting a paper to a journal, you're quite dependent on the journal giving you guidance in terms of what they will accept. And, and there's a process to be going through and you might go through it you, know, you might potentially you know submit to a journal and then be rejected or whatever and go to another journal so there's going to be presumably some decision making going on as well, what you know what are the journals willing to accept what do they want to accept um if we spend the time on a pls at this stage are we going to have to change that next week or something i mean that's that's i'm, I'm sort of stating the obvious but i guess that's all just part of the thinking yeah yeah and something that we found is not, not um you know it's the minority of journals at the moment have specific guidance about pls so it might right. be that they might accept one but they just haven't really thought about it yet to so it's all, yeah so it's always i think worth worth asking the question rather than waiting for them to ask you for one if okay. that makes sense okay. Okay. so i think it's okay. kind of on, on both sides working together okay okay um there's several several questions which are talking about re patient reviewers of pls Mm -hmm. So again, just again, just just to help me a little bit, or just let's just spell this out. Um, if you're preparing a PLS to go alongside an article, does that automatically come with an assumption that you have patient reviewers reviewing that PLS before submission? Is that is that an obvious point that people are picking up on here? Yeah. So um, we would recommend as best practice having patients involved okay. in creating the plain language summary, just because otherwise it's difficult to know whether right. you know, actually the potential end user is going to find you know the the content to be suitable. So internally at Envision we have a patient review panel, uh -huh. and so they're actually contracted as freelancers, and so they work with us to review plain language summaries or different kinds of content or provide consultancy. Um, sometimes we find that clients have their own quite strong patient links and they actually then kind of go and get their own sort of patient partners to review the plain language summary. So it's really just making sure that you discuss, you know, wanting to have the patient review, seeing on which side it's going to be and just getting that planned. Okay, kind so uh, that, that's, that's, that's probably covered off several questions actually, which are all around about how do you identify the patients who are going to get involved in this process. So you're saying there are various answers to that question <laughs> yeah um sort of where you can find them i guess yeah um and i see a question there actually about them being suggested by, by hcp, HCP authors yeah. that's not necessarily something we'd recommend um because obviously you've got the whole consideration there of the relationship between doctor and patient and then as a co-author the kind of the balance of power depending on the relationship might it might not be something that we would we would say would be like a natural fit because you you know you kind of want someone to feel completely independent and able yeah, to yeah. sort of you know give their give their feedback so i think that's not an approach we've necessarily taken it's been more kind of a panel of professional patients as it were who okay. who sort of act as freelancers and don't have a personal connection okay again forgive the stupid questions but does does a patient um a patient involving themselves in a pls make them an author or a contributor or how do you handle that sort of distinction so and, and how do the other i mean how do the hcps feel about the patient you know being put in that position yeah so the approach that we've taken with um the template that's part of our toolkit is to acknowledge the medical writer or whoever the author was obviously right. in our case it would be a medical writer yeah. um, and the funding source for transparency yeah. but in the same way that you wouldn't name everyone who's reviewed it internally or within the client or within the agency we don't name the patient there so that's a kind of a different question to the patient authorship question okay, okay. um for the pls we wouldn't you know sort of name everyone who's been involved with a manuscript it would be different so they would have to be happy to be named as an author or okay. acknowledged as just a contributor and have their affiliations there so that would be a, a conversation to have with them because if it was someone who wanted to contribute but also wanted to remain anonymous that might not be possible because yeah. obviously they have to they have to sort of be included for transparency. Yeah, okay, okay. And there's so much focus on transparency that th that, that must be more of a problem in practice than, than it sounds again, I would have thought, to get that balance right. Um, John's asked a question which was going through my mind and, and I wanted to ask somehow. So what's he said, um, or basically he's talking about, guy, is there guidance around the level of compensation to be paid at far, fair market value for involving patients in medical communications? Um, and indeed, what are the rules around? You know, you can't pay HCPs for authorship of articles. So, how, how, what are some of the points to be taken into account there in terms of paying the patients and how to go about 
establishing a whether you can and b how much mm-hmm. um, so our kind of line on whether to pay or not is that you pay um, because you're kind of seeing someone as bringing their own expertise that's valuable and so to kind of say that you can't pay them that doesn't really sort of sit right with us in terms of how obviously paying for authorship that's a different question and that's something which i don't think there's any specific guidance addressing um it might be that you're able to kind of compensate for travel costs and things like that like you might do for an author but not any sort of inducement to be an author but i think that's a question which um hasn't really been covered yet um so sorry just to break into you what we're talking about here is the um it's not being covered in terms of patients themselves i mean it's fairly clear in in some ways in terms of paying for authorship to the to the hcps or whatever yeah so you you are you are seeing patients as a different group who may Um, be treated slightly differently as authors am i understanding correctly not necessarily so i think the main question that comes up there is if you're having a patient if some like an academic author they're having a salary from their academic institution okay and a patient might not be in a position where they have that so i think there's a bit of a gray area there yeah and yeah. so we need a bit of clarity about you know how that might be approached okay. but i think um in general we would say that kind of payment is a recognition of value and you know we sort of have um there's no specific guidance about fair market value um, that I'm aware of. I know that PFMD, again, are doing a bit of work around okay. um, legal contracting for patients. Um, and I think there might be some discussions around payment as part of that. So they're um, kind of releasing a range of how-to guides, for, which are quite like practical things, covering things like this. Um, okay. But we don't have any sort of current guidance about fair market value, but we'd approach it in, um, again, just quite a transparent way and say that we do we do pay our patients. Can you just, again, I'm, I'm hoping I'm asking questions useful to other people. The PFMD is the way you're referring to it, yeah? Just, just you mentioned it several times. Um, just, just give us a, 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 a brief who they are and how do you find out more about them? Um, so they're a global group. They focus quite a lot on um, creating technology solutions. So they um, are at the moment um, developing a range of how-to guides so i uh, probably go back slightly but they they basically are doing a lot of the groundwork on how to do patient involvement so they released okay. um their patient engagement quality guidance last year so that is a kind of a very broadly applicable guide i think it has seven different categories which are questions you need to think about in any patient engagement activity to make sure that you're kind of basically doing it right and it's not tokenistic and you're including everybody's perspectives and you know you're creating a diverse group so that they're, they're kind of looking at more the practical how to do patient involvement oh, sorry um, who are they who are they who's behind that so um i think they're led by a guy called nicholas brooke who is based in france um but they are a global group so they have sort of lots of different stakeholders lots of different um okay. supporters um i think from within um, industry as well okay okay is it driven by the patient side of the fence yeah. okay okay yeah. um a couple of quick questions um uh there's a comment here from fiona about the reading age do you what, what what reading age is there a simple answer to that um do you aim to use when you're writing these pls is there a simple answer? Um, so i would say it's not not a massively simple answer because we do use a readability tool Okay. Um, so we use a tool called Readable, which kind of okay. collates the scores of lots of other different readability tools because there's kind of issues with all of them. None of them are perfect. Um, and so that actually gives grades rather than levels. Um, and so we'd be aiming for an A or B, which is obviously the two best grades. Um, I think uh, it's difficult to kind of give a specific reading level because it's quite nuanced. So you don't, obviously, there's terminology which you might need to include in a PLS, which might drag the reading level down if you're scoring it with a tool so for example the name of the drug or the name of a condition so it's about i think more the writer developing the skills and having the nuance to make something understandable even if it might have to contain some more technical terms but um i've seen eight to twelve um in terms of years in the school system as being um kind of given as a target it, it, it always seems to be the sort of rule of thumb, doesn't it? Okay, okay, okay. All right, look, um, um, I've got one on the clock and we're a little bit over where I wanted to be. So I'm, I'm going to cut through this and suggest we um, 
finish the recording at this stage, if that's okay, um, Laurie. Um, as I've said earlier to the, those of you online at the moment, please don't rush away because we can carry on talking for a while yet. Um, but for just the purpose of the recording, um, can I just say a huge thanks to Laurie, um, make the point that um, you're very happy you said that yourself for people to reach out to you via LinkedIn and so on. Sure. Um, and assuming this recording has worked, it'll be on Network Pharma TV later on where you'll find lots of other similar sort of um, Medcoms related type of videos. So please feel free to go and have a look. So just for the moment, I'm going to close the recording, say thank you very much, goodbye, and just ask Laurie to give us a wave. Bye-bye. Thank you.